Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. I'm excited for today's show because I'm bringing someone aboard that I've known for a couple of years, and I've watched all the magnificent things she does in the world just blossom and become even more magnificent. So my question to you is, what do these have in common? Channeling, QHHT, light language, Hathor, extraterrestrials, past life regressions? Hmm. Well, we're going to go into these and more because Dr. Yafi Yair is here and she is an intuitive, a channel, an author, a past life regressionist, and a doctor of clinical psychology. Yafi channels Hathor, Elementals, ETs, and Extra Dimensionals. This show won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to. It's high ranking under self-improvement and Apple Podcasts and just won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do energy work out in the world. You can take a class or become a facilitator. Go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com, and join them. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist. I'm also a certified shaman. I am a book writing coach, so I take your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status. I do all the heavy lifting for the author, and I also show you how to write your book if you haven't started yet. Additionally, I am a boutique publicist, and I get people booked on radio and podcast shows, and I also have a product out there. If you'd like to learn how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts, become your own publicist, you can do so as well. But you could start out with my free gift because I give you all the templates and how-tos. Go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift and find out how you can become way more visible as a spiritual messenger. That's D-E-B-B-I. D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash gift. My guest, Dr. Yafi Yair, she is a doctor in clinical psychology and hypnosis, and she combines her expertise in holistic wellness with spiritual exploration. Beyond her clinical realms, Dr. Yafi is an energy worker, an intuitive, and a channeler. She brings messages from an array of spiritual luminaries such as Hathor, Earth Elements, Fairies, and Extraterrestrials. Dr. Yaffe's mission is to enrich the lives of others through a heart-centered exploration of consciousness and the self. I also want to talk a little bit about her book, which is Conversations with the Earth. And to find out more about Dr. Yair, go to Yaffe, Y-A-F-I channeling dot Com. And at the end of the show, we'll also tell you a place to find her as she'll be speaking rather soon in person. And with that, I bring the amazing Yafi Yair to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you. Hi, Debbie. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I love everything around you right now. I love <laughs> the butterflies and what's in your hair. Having known you for a few years, I know this is your personality being expressed. It is so beautiful. And I love how creative you are, even with how you look. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like the way we look is, is a way to express our spirit. You know, our bodies is one of the ways we're expressing our spirit mm -hmm. here in this physical world. So it's an opportunity with our hair, our clothes, anything. Years ago, you got me into, I don't even remember what they are called. I think they're like fairy. Fairy hair. hair. Yes. <laughs> I remember seeing that in you and I'm like, I would like that, please. And then somebody <laughs> did it for me and it lasted for nine months. I had to start cutting them out after a while. They were, these fairy things were really permanent. They were so yes. beautiful. Yes. I love them. <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk about your path because I think that's pretty fascinating just quickly here at the start. So people can kind of understand the hero's arc, if you will, that brought you to where you are now channeling messages from masters and guides like Hathor, Earth Elements and Light mm -hmm. Councils. And frankly, way more having just read this book. I mean, it's everything, the elements which I thought were very beautiful 
And I quite understood, mm -hmm. especially from a shamanic point of view, including planets like Andromeda and yeah. So, and brotherhood <laughs> councils and light councils. So talk about how did you get here? What were some of the twists and turns for you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I completed a doctorate in clinical psychology, dissertation, internship, the whole thing. Um, of course, cost a fortune, took half of my life. Uh, it was a passion for sure. And I thought that was, was what was going to be a clinical psychologist being in the clinical world. However, when I finished my internship, during my internship, I got into hypnosis. And that's when I discovered that hypnosis is a great gateway to combine clinical and spiritual passion. Mm -hmm. Because with hypnosis, you can explore the subconscious, go to past lives. I became familiar with Brian Weiss and I was fascinated. So I thought that was going to be my clinical practice. And I very quickly learned that the clinical world is not very welcoming to the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had to choose either a holistic spiritual approach or clinical. And I chose the spiritual holistic. It, I, you know, it was a part of my personal spiritual explosion of spiritual growth around 2012. I know many have had similar experiences around that time. And I just couldn't choose the mainstream. I just couldn't. I had to go with my passion against all logic. And that's what I did. And I started developing my intuition and giving readings first just to friends and family and then to actually professionally. And that really connected me even more to the spiritual world. And I discovered Dolores Cannon and QHHT, which you mentioned, which is an even deeper spiritual exploration of consciousness and of the human mind and spirit. And that took me even deeper. And then approximately three years ago, I decided to dedicate my life to channeling. And that's what I did. And I dove in completely. And I would say that ended almost my relationship with the clinical world. It gave me closure in a way. I still offer therapy and I still offer uh, definitely hypnosis, um, but it's, I no longer see myself as a clinical person gone spiritual. I am permanently comfortably in a spiritual profession with any clinical background that I have, just as background as a part of the tools that I have to take me to where I am today and to help others. Now, in terms of the channeling, you know, it's such a wild world. Even just the concept of channeling is wild. And then when you really get into it, you have to be open. You have to be, you know, willing to be in the flow and to be vulnerable and just to be raw. And doing that, to my surprise, my love for nature and the earth really started coming through in the connection. And I really didn't expect that. Everybody around me was interested in extraterrestrials and aliens and communicate to different galactic beings. And in a way that is all I knew what to expect. And that's not exactly what came through me. So I was really surprised. And my mind kept on being stretched and expanding and expanding uh, with what is, first of all, what is communicable. The fact, for example, that water consciousness mm -hmm. can actually communicate with us. It may sound obvious and simple to some, but coming, if you're a really left brain person or coming from a clinical or scientific world, that's really out there. That's a lot to accept. Yeah, unless, right, you're part of the spiritual tribe, in which case for us, it makes sense. If everything's energy, if everything is consciousness, then it makes complete sense. I love that it has a point of view, if you will, and an expression of being and wisdom to impart all exactly. of these elements exactly there's so much wisdom to gain out of these different perspectives us as humans we have a very very narrow perspective we keep on again stretching it and expanding it it's a part of our journey but by its nature it's very very limited you know our physical nature our physical brain and those other sources if we take into example the elements water fire air they're not limited by a physical body. 
So their perception and understanding is completely different. They're coming from a point of view that's difficult for us to really wrap our head around. And channeling is a bridge. So we're taking the human concept, human concepts, human language, and then we're taking wisdom that is much more abstract, much more expanded than ours, much more zoomed out. They like saying that they're zoomed out and then we need to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until they can channel it with words, with words through human, through a human. You know, what's very interesting about that, Yafi, is you know, I've definitely gone down the deep path with Dolores Cannon's books and all these amazing transcriptions of the sessions she's had. And so many of the people she put under regression came back and were talking about being elements, particles, clouds, creators of worlds. So it is very possible that you, me, everybody watching and listening at some point in your multitude of lives and experiences going on concurrently, you are also an element, a water, an air, a fire, et cetera, a mountain. A fairy. A fairy. A galaxy. A ga you are a galaxy of stars. You know, that's mind blowing. <laughs> Really? We, we exist on so many levels and dimensions, and we see it as at some point I was a fairy. But again, mm -hmm. this is our human mind used to seeing things in a linear sense. But a more accurate way of saying it, not that at some point I was a fairy, on some level, on some dimension, I am a fairy. So the same for you, on some dimension, you are right now a fairy, you are right now a mountain, you are right now Andromeda or a Syrian entity, or maybe a whole Syrian collective, like we, we don't know. And actually, it's not that we don't know if, it's that and much more, because we are everything. We're just able to conceive of it one layer at a time. And yeah. one time our layer is, oh, okay, I have a fairy counterpart. Huh. So this is where we're at in terms of being able to understand it. You know, I had this interesting identification uh, last week. I was talking to Daryl Anka, Daryl, who channels Bashar. And I don't know where this came from, but I suddenly had this feeling, you know, I would like it if one of my lifetimes, I am a wisdom teacher who comes through, whether it's as a singular being or as a collective to somebody like you. And you can channel the wisdom I assist you with from whatever realm I'm in. And I thought, what a great job. That's so perfect mm -hmm. for me. My whole life <laughs> has been about, and I think lives have been about frequency, communication, teaching, leading masses. It's like, mm -hmm. that would be an amazing job. Yeah, so have. this is a part of your training right now. <laughs> that makes so much sense. Right? That is very cool. Yes. And I've been and I've been thinking about it so much since I blurted that out. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm on board. And then we all know as metaphysicians, we're constantly creating, right? Nothing happens till we speak it, think it, and put some energy into it. And I'm like, all right, well, wherever this is manifesting, you know, as long as I'm benevolent and of the light and really here to help that would be so beautiful to be able to access information help someone to help many people yes uh, and job. i think yeah and i think a lot of beings that's what they do so they have the ability from the spirit from beyond the veil to come through with information with wi wisdom with guidance to us and not only us right we're just one civilization they're who knows how many, what number, if there is a number to how many civilizations are out there. Mm -hmm. So it's endless and it is a cycle of being helped and helping and being helped and helping. <laughs> it's a beautiful cycle. I feel like it's a part of creation, that cycle of supporting others in their growth and then adding to your own growth. And then with your own growth, you can help others even more. And the cycle of help and um, working together in that way. How does it work for you? Do you go into trance? I'll just call it that to keep it simple. And do mm -hmm. you ask 
one of the energies in particular to come through, or do you just get open and see who needs to show up? Mm -hmm. So I have always called a specific source to come through. So it can be a specific entity. So for example, I call Hathor, I call on Jesus, I call on Viola, or if it is more open, oh, Viola is a fairy <laughs> that I channel. So that's who Viola is. And when it is more open, it's not just open to any, it's open with a specific guidance. So for example, um, in my, I hold weekly channeling Zoom groups and in my group, we can say, okay, today the theme is contact. So I'm going to invite any sources that can come through me that can contribute wisdom about contact, that can add their knowledge, their guidance. So it can be semi-open in that way, but there's always some guidance, some qualifier. And in general, when I open, I have an invocation that I state. I used to state it out loud when I started channeling, and now I just say it inside. And the purpose of the invocation is to put me in that state of mind, in that state of being that only the most evolved and pure guides can come through. So I put my, my invocation is super short. It's I play in love and light. I open to you now. So it's very, very short. But when I say in my heart, I play in love and light, I really put myself in that space, a playful space, a curiosity about realms of love and light and creation. So I put myself in that excited, open, loving and light state. And from that state, only sources that resonate in that frequency can come through me and connect. So I already narrow the pathway to the type of frequency I'm inviting to um, cooperate, work with me in that way, play with me in that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, you know, and I resonate because even in my morning practice, when I call in help or connection, I'm always so clear, benevolent of the light. Mm -hmm. I couch everything, whether it's extraterrestrials, extra dimensionals, guides, angels, whatever, that that's all I'm calling in. And then of course, that is my experience. So mm -hmm. I think it's beautiful to protect oneself like that. And also, you know, just be very clear with our reality where we're operating. Exactly, exactly. And also put yourself in terms of how you feel in that state. So yes, you want to have a very clear intention. That's the most important. And you also want to be in that expensive, beautiful light space especially if you're doing any type of spiritual work, especially if you're doing it for others, but also for yourself, because you don't want to compromise your integrity. And, and you know, you can be vulnerable to different things if you don't make sure that you're not, that you're solid. So putting yourself in this um, joyful state, whether through gratitude or through love, these are the fastest ways, also raises at your actual frequency that then in a practical manner only allows those higher frequency sources to connect to you. So important, so important. And I think that's nice for people who work with you to know too, uh, they're protected with the information they hear. So wild journey to get you here. And uh, before we started, we were both saying just how fascinating our journeys have been, how unexpected they've been. Did you encounter a lot of magical or deeply spiritual pivots, like anything notable that you can share? Yes, absolutely. There were so many, and not only with the channeling world, but also with the channeling, but in general, in my spiritual journey, since I really made that leap of faith, um, there's so many magical experiences. Anything from visitations from my mom who was crossed over through electronics, through um, lucid dreams, all kinds of visitations, turning on and off of different lights, all kind of like physical and spiritual manifestations to also, yes, related to the channeling. So the first time I channeled Viola the fairy, um, she mentioned hummingbirds and colorful birds. And she said how the fairies and little colorful birds are very closely connected in many ways. And 
it was a very exciting channeling session. Me and my group were like on cloud nine. Then I went to do a long meditation. In the meditation, I asked for contact. I said, I want physical contact. I want physical signs of the fairies, not just the, chan just the channeling. And so I got out of my meditation and I went to the kitchen and I see this colorful bird that I've never seen before. First of all, there was a cardinal. Actually, before the, the new colorful bird, there was a beautiful red cardinal at the feeder at my window. And he was singing and, and hanging around and just spending so much time like that, so beautiful. And then this other colorful, beautiful bird that we've never seen before or after, it was red, blue, and yellow. So it was brightly, brightly colored, all these different colors. And it came to the window and it competed with the cardinal. And they just, they were there for about 20 minutes, <laughs> just spending time at the window. Again, completely unheard of. My husband, who did not know about any of this, was listening to a song about colorful birds. And without even knowing why, paused the song and came to the kitchen. And we were both standing there, shocked, looking at this amazing colorful birds doing all these things practically looks like it, it was trying to get into the house. So that's an example of a magical event, a sign, a contact that is nature related. Again, not quite ET, not what you would expect, but all these beautiful, magical experiences that keep on popping up and a lot of synchronicities, a lot of synchronicities. That's beautiful. Uh, what a great story. Do your fairies ever, or Viola, um, I'm not sure if there's other ones who come through, but does Viola the fairy ever ask you to leave her anything like honey or cream or butter? Is there any preference mm. she would like as an interaction or an exchange? I don't remember her ever expressing so verbally as I channeled her, but what I do know is that I, I love plants and so I garden a lot and I love plants and flowers and especially pollinator flowers and plants. And I honor the fairies when I do so. So I even have a fairy, a fairy corner with the little fairy statues and I have fun fairy lights, just like I have fairy hair. So I try to honor them in kind of an ongoing, a uh, way to give them beautiful spaces and plant a lot of plants and flowers that they would enjoy in different lights and honor them um, also with my heart, right? So I would go there and feel the love and invite the fairies to, to work with my plants and to take care of the plants. So the garden is in beautiful balance and, and the plants are happy and the butterflies are happy. So I do offerings in that way. Um, and I do have bird feeders, so I do have seeds and nectar, nectar that I offer them. But again, only in terms of like the natural world. So I haven't offered anything separate. So I would take flowers that I'm growing and, I'm, and I offer, leave that as offering. But I don't bring things from the home like honey or fruits or anything like that. Mm. But you if just... they ask, I'll definitely bring them some, whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, we have left them some from time to time. But, you know, listening to you just gave me an idea. We This is kind of an interesting, weird story. Ooh, I would say a year ago, we noticed that we have some very nice plants and cactus in our garden. And we noticed that this giant cactus that was out by the street, by the sidewalk, that somebody had come in the middle of the night and sawed off the cactus and I assume transplanted it in their own space. Oh. Okay, weird, but okay. And then a couple of months after that, closer to the house, somebody came in. Now, now they're getting bold with a shovel and dug an entire plant out, per perfectly put back the soil, yes, and took away with a plant. Now this is like, hmm, not loving this. And it no. feels a little violating. Well, recently we've been doing a lot of traveling and we returned from our travels and I noticed in our front yard, right next to the house, we had these tall, beautiful plants that sprouted these red, orange flowers, spring, summer, fall. Again, completely dug out in the middle of the night, soil put back, so strange. So I started contacting my neighbors 
And they were very upset. One of my neighbors said, I had the same. Somebody stole two plumeria trees, which are very expensive. And so I decided to call the police. Now they're aware. And that's good. But there's this piece of me every time I think about planning something beautiful that's a little bit like, oh, I don't want someone to come up and steal it. But listening to you, Yafi, I'm thinking, what if I asked the fairies to patrol our garden in the front? Absolutely. Yeah, and it's not only the fairies. You know, we mentioned the elements before. We mentioned that everything has intelligence, has energy, has consciousness. Mm. The wind can help protect your property. Mm. The soil. I mean, so we're talking about the elements now. So it's the fairies, but it's really nature. It's our environment. It's everything around us. Everything around us is alive and it's talking to us. It's in conversation with us. It's communication with us all the time. So absolutely a part of our job is to expand our awareness. So we're aware that everything is intelligent, that everything is communicating and interacting with us. Mm. So inviting your environment to help you and work with you in that way. And you know that it's working with you because you're working with your land. You're Mm. planting beautiful trees. You're giving it love. You're even giving your fairies butter or honey or whatever. So you're having this relationship. It's not just you asking favors, but it is a relationship. Just like you give from yourself, And you know, when I give, usually what I give is love. So my offering is usually um, not physical, but it's a spectrum. So you can add the physical. And as long as it's relationship, you have your offering, it's okay to also have requests. That's what a relationship is. So absolutely ask your environment to help protect your land. But also, you know, we, we never know what's going on. Why is this person stealing plants? What are they doing? What is going through their mind? What is the lack that they are experiencing and dealing with that leads them to steal other people's plants? I mean, we are honestly blessed and lucky that we are not compelled to act in such strange ways and that we can plant our own plants and love our own plants and appreciate the work that it takes in growing those plants. Yes, thank you. That was a really astute point of view and very important. And I can even send, maybe not love, but a lot of compassion and abundance thoughts to someone or someone's who would even consider to steal into someone's yard in the middle the night to do something instead of just buying it on their own. Yeah. May we all have affluence. May we all be healthy and wealthy. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Um, what about extraterrestrial contact? Have you, now I've been in some circumstances, you and I together, <laughs> we've seen spacecraft. So yes. I know <laughs> what we've seen. Have you had your own spacecraft experiences or extraterrestrial contact, anything? So actually my first UFO sighting or experience was when I was a child in Israel. Mm. I was eight, about eight, maybe 10. What city did you grow up in? Batyam, which is a suburb of Tel Aviv. It's right Mm. at the center. It's five minutes from Tel Aviv. And I I was playing with a friend outside and it was broad daylight. It was early afternoon and we were looking up and we saw this bright light in the sky. And again, it's daylight. There are no other lights in the sky. And we just stood there in awe, what is this? And all of a sudden this light in the sky made three zigzags, round zigzags, smaller and smaller, and then took off and it just shot up. And we looked at each other and like, did you see that? Did you see that? And I had her describe exactly what she saw so I could compare. And that was my first um, experience. So I was quite young and I know a lot of people actually had experience around the age eight. It, for some mm-hmm. reason, it's very common. And for me, it was the opening, the introduction to the fact that, yes, we're not alone. Yes, it was, I don't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was something extraordinary. I knew it was more and I knew it was real. 
And I think that was extremely important. And it did not start a life of looking for extraterrestrials and stuff like that. So in some way, it was put in the back of my mind as life continued, but it was there. So that was my first and probably most significant sighting when I was quite young. Since then, um, I've asked if was I abducted? Um, what happened? You know, we saw light. We'd, I don't even know if I had missing time. I was a child. I was playing with a friend. Who knew? We were outside for hours without supervision. There would I wouldn't even know if I had missing time. And what came up for me that I wasn't abducted physically, but um, astrally, energetically, uh, there was much more interaction than communication happening that I was just not aware of. Mm -hmm. so cool. But it was definitely a hello. It was definitely personal, hmm. which is strange, you know? I think I've only realized that in the last couple of years. I didn't think it was personal. I just thought I happened to be there, just like my friend. We just happened to be there and see this light dancing in the sky now i know that it's not random yeah and it could have been your people too right it was my people it was my serious my syrian people yeah i feel you know now i feel that so clearly hmm. that makes a lot of sense to me when they uh connect like that because i hear that a lot that you know at first it's an experience and then it's a recognition oh this is family right? This is, yes. these are my beings. Exactly. Exactly. Family. Family. And, so, and since then I've had different sightings. They're not nearly as impressive. So mm -hmm. I'm, uh, <laughs> whenever my husband and I do any light, uh, sky watch, which actually we don't do very often. We almost always see shooting, shooting orbs. So there's white light, white energy that shows up for us on a regular basis. And not only where we live, we've done so in different locations and we see similar uh, light, white, translucent energy shooting by. And, you know, something that you wrote about quite a bit in the book or the beings did through you was about the rise of the feminine, the divine feminine on earth at yes. this time. And I just want to say to folks, who are watching or listening. And if you want to watch us and you're listening, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger or go to Spotify, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. You could watch us, I suggest it. And so the rise of the divine feminine. Um, love that. Mm -hmm. So apropos. And yes. I think it's been a prophecy for a long time. So what is your... Mm -hmm understanding of the rise of the divine feminine right now yeah that's another thing that came to me as a complete surprise i did not expect that um and so i started channeling hathor who through me comes comes as a through as a pathway of the divine feminine and from the beginning i loved her energy i didn't know who hathor was the first time i channeled her i thought it was a he and when I channel her, this beautiful, flowy, feminine energy comes with them. And I'm just like in heaven. I'm loving every second of it. And, um, and from the beginning, she said, yes, this is a relationship. We're going to continue uh, working together, me and her. And she talked a lot about the rising of the feminine and the importance of that in our society. So that's something that came up for me almost immediately when I started channeling. And it has been uh, actually quite pivotal, quite important. Also in my personal life, connecting to that feminine flow more and more and more to find balance. In the same way, it is coming now to help us as humans find balance. So the information that comes through is that our society has been very oriented through the male gaze. Um, all practically all authority structures in our society are very male oriented and that has been that way in very, very long. And it is time to change that. And it has to change for further balance to be achieved. So the rise of the feminine is something very, very real in our society. It's women finding their voice. It's women um, connecting 
to that divine feminine flow in a very personal way. And it's true for men as well. And there are men that embrace it. So if you speak to men in our world today, there are many men that realize what we just said, that realize that, that society has been too much uh, dragged to the male, skewed to the male view. And the men that realize it and the men that embrace this rise of the feminine are not having a hard time with that because it doesn't take away from their manhood. It just makes them more balanced, just like it makes us women more balanced to connect to that essence. So it's very interesting. So some men, of course, and some women, I'm sure, but more men are reacting with fear. And they have a hard time accepting this rise of the feminine and accepting other changes that are happening in our world, in our society. And that's a part of it. Because accepting the rise of the feminine, feeling that flow means having a bigger trust in yourself and your universe. Uh, trying to control less your environment and situation and what's happening. And, you know, even if we take just that, that's huge especially today when changes are happening faster and faster and there are bigger changes everything is accelerating everything is opening up so if you learn to open your heart and to have that trust and to go with that flow which is a more feminine trait then you're going to have an easier time adjusting to all these changes and that's something that the elements talk a lot about as well how you react to these changes, how you react to confusion, to uncertainty. And the more you're able to go with it, the more you're able to choose the path of least resistance, the easier it is, the more flowy it is, the more you can integrate all these changes and take them with you and continue and thrive. Beautiful. Well, that's a perfect segue. Would you be willing to channel for us at this time? And if so, I'd, happy to. I'd love that so much to give us an opportunity to experience your amazing channeling. Let us know, is there anything we need to know as you prepare to allow whatever gorgeous energy to come through you? Is there anything we need to know while you get into that? Energy? So my, my process is pretty quick. Like I said, I just turn inward. I say my invocation. Um, you know, the energies are already here. It's something that I've learned. They don't really come when I call them. It's more my awareness is opening to them so they can then channel through me, but they're already here. So as soon as I open, I can just jump on that flow, on that wave and allow them. So there's not too much to know. Now, in terms of the source, do we want to call Hathor the divine feminine? I would really like that. Yes. Yeah. I've experienced her through you before yes. and I rather love her. So that would be awesome this time. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So I'm going to call her. And like I said, it's a pretty quick process. Um, and you can just talk to her, them, her, I say her, they refer to themselves as they, if you want, you can ask her why I trust you a hundred percent to lead the conversation. <laughs> you can ask whatever you want. I'm going to invite her right now. Thank you. Blessings. Mm. Thank you for being here and welcome so much. It's beautiful to reconnect with you. It is our pleasure to be here in this space and share your beautiful heart energy space here with you. I understand, Hathor, that rather than going by the pronoun she, you express yourself as a they. Can you explain to us why you go by a collective they as opposed to a she slash Hathor? Yes. We will say that as when you reach a certain level of awareness, you become aware of the multitudes of your parts. So when we talk we do have an identity that 
forms for the purpose of this communication, but it forms from a larger, you may call it a collective, but you can also see it as a cloud. So it's a collective as it's made out of in individuals, but it is also a one whole, a one whole that includes many and much within it. Because of that awareness of everything that, in, that is included in that understanding of the self, we consider ourselves as we, as plural. That's what comes out as natural. And you will notice that it's not just us, that most of the time you do, when you encountered guides, when you encountered channeled material, there is the pronoun of us, we, them, and it is for that reason. It is not because there are many people talking to you right now. It is because there is an awareness of the multitudes of the parts of the self. So taking that one step forward, it will be one day when it will be natural for you all of you to refer to yourselves in that way an example would be when a family is a couple a married couple and their kids start using the word we and us and they see themselves as a group as a unit as an entity so they're aware of their own personality but they're also aware of their we status mm -hmm. Beautiful. Hathor, you are closely associated with the concept of the divine feminine, and we on Earth, humanity, is moving into the divine feminine at this time. What are a few things we should be paying attention to so we can fully heal and embody the feminine principle to really help the beautiful Mother Earth and to help humanity, men, women, and everything in between to thrive. Yes. So connecting to your divine feminine can appear in many different ways. One, as you mentioned in the conversation, conversation before, is the ability to flow and not to try to control and put um, your own limits on situations. But we will say that the bigger picture of connecting to your divine feminine is really connecting to your inner creator. So that process of learning to trust more deeply, learning to love more openly, and learning to discern rather than judge, all of these are feminine, divine feminine qualities that will then open you up and help you clear up all the junk that needs to clear up for you to step into your own inner creator. And this is really the process that is happening now. So we're talking about the rise of the divine feminine and how you integrate it personally. But when you look at the bigger picture, the reason the divine feminine is rising in your society, the reason this balance is increasing, everything is increasing. Your molecules are accelerating and you are asked now to step into your role as a divine creator. It sounds big because it is. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful, blessed, honored role of humanity that it is only now beginning to take on and to understand in that way oh my gosh okay so so many questions thank you i actually i'm thanking you mostly for your energy right now it's so calming and embracing um feels like just a warm wash of love. I really appreciate you. You are very um, 
compatible with the energy. So you are able to experience it in a very open way. Mm. Hathor, you are represented by the lioness, which I do resonate with. You're also represented by a serpent and sometimes by a sycamore tree. And you're also linked to the sacred, liberating kundalini energy forces. So I'm going to couch this question with a little story. I recently returned from Italy. I was gone for three weeks, and two of those weeks I spent in an ashram. Very first time I've ever done an ashram. And there was a Swami Um, It's his ashram and people come from all around the world and he would work with people and sit in front of them, for instance, and touch them here on the third eye and do various energetic things to them. And I would watch as certain people, not everybody, but maybe six people out of 40 would go into this almost convulsive kundalini massive experience. I don't know what that feels like. I know when I was touched on the third eye and had energy work, I know stuff was moving. But I also kind of felt left out, if I were to be honest, because I don't know what this very free, it almost looks like orgasmic energy. It almost looks sexual to me, but it's certainly very beautiful and compelling, sometimes very distracting. Is liberating kundalini energy activations. Is that about letting go and surrendering? Can some people do it? Not all people. Can you talk about what allows someone to have this full on kundalini experience? Yes, yes. So we will say that (laughs) it's funny because the way you ask the question is, can everyone do it? Can, are these people special for being able to do it? And it is funny because it's, it is something that is happening to them. And it is something that is not always experienced as pleasant or pleasurable. Oh. So it is not necessarily something to envy. So we will explain it, explain what is a Kundalini awakening in the way you are describing from our perspective. So generally speaking, the process of evolving in the way that is human evolution and earth evolution is happening now is opening your heart space and learning to um, really be and operating and come from that heart space. What does it mean? How does your perception shift when you're in that heart space? So this is the process. Some people, their energetic pattern is not able to go through this process quite yet. Something needs to shift, something needs to awaken within them, often in a very dramatic way, to open their pathways so this energy can flow through them with the knowing that this awakening will then open the pathway of the heart so they can themselves go through this process. So if you are experiencing the process of opening up, of expanding, of improving your intuition and your connection, and you're feeling your heart opening and growing, you do not need that Kundalini awakening. Mm Does that make sense? Yeah, that's amazing. The Kundanili awakening is almost like a way to flush their system. So energy can start flowing. And often it's violent because it was blocked and now it's open, it's ripped open. So often it is violent and filled with sensations, sometimes pain, sometimes actual physical and emotional pain because it is a tearing open of the energetic system, which sometimes then leads to energetic chaos as everything is open and everything is a mess and needs to settle, needs to find its flow, its place. 
the person, the entity needs to find its control and its place within this flow and then learn to control, to control so you can lead it in the pathway that you choose. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. A friend of mine experienced it with the same Swami, but here in Los Angeles, uh, she had a very quick session with him. He touched her third eye and literally for two to three minutes, because I saw it on video, she couldn't stop. She could not stop what was happening with her body and they had to actually prop her back up. Um, fascinating. is so, And I have to say, listening to you, that there's an element to me that is aware of other people that plays into this because it feels very public, if you will, to have a response like this, such a, whether it's violent or pleasurable, but to have this enormous energy release and have the body convulsing and have the sounds coming out of the person and, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. arching of the back and all sorts of things yes. happen for different people. And I'm so super aware. I don't know if I could let go like that in public. Well, if that actually happened to you, that means you would be in that space of accepting it. And then you would be at least okay enough for that to happen to you. If you're not open to it, it wouldn't happen to you in that format unless your higher self deems it necessary. Yeah. And the, the perversity of it is, is that there's a strong element of me that wants to experience it all at the same time. That's like, oh, what does that feel like? What is that like? How, what kind of difference would that create for me? So mm -hmm. I guess my big message is to my higher self, I'm open. I'm open. Mm -hmm. We can handle whatever happens. Yes. Again, if this process would be advantageous to you, it's possible that you simply don't need it because those pathways are already open. Mm, thank you so much. That's super helpful. You are known, Hathor, as the Egyptian goddess of love, beauty, fertility, and you are also associated with the dead in the afterlife. What wisdom can you share with those who are listening to you right now about death and about losing someone that we love dearly? Yes. So there are two separate issues here. One, what can I share with you about death? So death, as you know, is not the end. Death is awakening to the life beyond the body. So when a person dies, they actually awaken. So for the person and for the living, physically living, it is a beautiful process. Once the fear of the physical body has come down, the process of dying is beautiful. Once you're on the other side, you are aware of your livelihood in ways that you are not able to do easily when you're in the body. So it is a beautiful, exhilarating experience not to be feared or not only to be feared some fear is natural of the unknown but also to accept as a beautiful and exciting part step in your life so this is what i have to share in general about death now you have mentioned losing someone you loved. And we will say that despite the beauty and glory of death that we are talking about, as a physically living creature who loses an, a loved one in the physical world, the loss is very real. The fact that they continue to exist, the fact that they are free now is comforting, but it does not replace the pain of the loss. 
And we want to mention how important it is to honor that pain, honor that loss, and mourn the loss. You are not denying your spiritual reality by allowing yourself to cry and hurt and go through physical-based processes. It is a part of your existence. What, what you must do is learn to go through these processes and maintain a loving, kind, and gentle self attitude. Mm. Yeah, I can say, I don't think I've experienced extraordinary loss, but I certainly have had animals that I loved dearly die, um, grandparents that I was extremely close with. And most recently, maybe five, six months ago, my mother passed. And I think the difference for me is the last two deaths last year, close together, uh, which one was a dog and one was my mother, I was involved in their last moments or days. So shamanistically, I was able to show up and do last rites over them and to help say prayers and things to help guide them to the light. There was something very extraordinary about being involved. Um, yeah, that I felt like I, less powerless than I had in the past, just witnessing something and way more of a guide, if you will, of, and giving, I think mostly it was giving someone something I want at the end, that there were people there. There was someone there who loved me. There was someone there who cared, who could show me, help me, uh, point me in the right direction about what was happening in the moment and where the light was, where the love was and how to let go. And it felt so powerful and even informed my grief a lot. It changed Absolutely. it. Yes, because what happens is then your awareness has increased and you were able to step into a role that you were not able to do before years ago. But now with the growth and advancement that you have allowed yourself and pushed forward, your awareness has increased to include that role, that role of a guide, that role of the one who knows and can then shed a light for the ones who may know less at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. And that connects to the conversation you had before of your desire to be a guide. So you have started this role. And this is what you experience in these two examples of transition. And having that expanded awareness, having been able to step into the role, this role and provide and be in that role has changed and will change your mourning, your experience of loss. Because as we said, your awareness is now expanded and can include more. So it doesn't eliminate the pain. It doesn't get rid of it, but it gives it a little bit of a different perspective as a result, you experience it a little differently. And the most important part that as a result, you are no longer helpless. Mm -hmm. You are now an active participant in this process, which allows you to lead it in the direction that you want, but also remember the divine flow, the divine feminine principle of going with the flow and allowing things to happen and unravel even in ways you did not expect them to yes. and still be okay with it and still go with that flow and still stay in that inner space of knowing and of power. That was genius to bring it back to that. And that is so apropos. And that is exactly correct. What you just said 
that was my experience was rather being at the effect of something, somebody dying, something maybe I didn't prefer was happening instead to literally being in the flow, the surrender, but also a contributor to the best possible outcome in that moment. And then yes, it completely changed my relationship with death and then my experience thereafter, the type of grief. Um, and I find Absolutely. that I heal very quickly. Absolutely. You are stepping into your light mm -hmm. and the consequences are beautiful. Mm -hmm. The process itself is turbulent and has ups and downs within it. And you learn to, again, accept them and go with them. But the result is always beautiful yeah. because the result is openness. The result is always towards more openness, more love, more groundedness and more participation. So what you learn is through hurting and experiencing these experiences, you then get to include others in your experience and participate with your environment in a different role, in a different level than you were able to participate with it mm -hmm. before. Um, Hathor, I'm gonna change here a little bit. And I think you know, from a prior conversation I had with you, I'm kind of, I don't wanna say obsessed, but I'm extremely interested in the sacred sexuality Isis temple from Egypt. I would love to know more about it, such as what kind of lessons were taught there? What were the, the temple students adept at? What was being healed or experienced either by the goddesses working there, if you will, or the people, clients, if you will, coming to the temple so we will start by saying that just as you mentioned it is indeed isis specialty and we will also mention that isis is a part of the same pathway of the divine feminine now in her specialty is utilizes utilizing what you call sexual energy it is actually the same as kundalini energy, the same as spiritual energy, vital energy. It is the same substance. And it was taught for, it, there are men and women parts to it, but the focus is on women learning to then tune into that specific energy as this energy is power, it is force and then work with this energy. So there are different levels of awareness of your own energy. There are a lot of principles to be learned that were taught and are still ta taught in different formats in those temples though, were taught in ancient Egypt. So it's not only being aware of your energy, there are a lot of principles to know about energy and about how to, focus attention and thought and work with different colors and different textures. So there's a lot of knowledge that goes in there, intellectual, what you would call intellectual knowledge and spiritual knowledge, but a lot of practical experiential knowledge. And some of it is what we were talking about in terms of tapping into your own creator. This is a similar process. However, it was done then in very, we would call it concentrated, condensed manner, to targeting the feminine power, the feminine energy. Part of it is similarly to what you're experiencing today, that more feminine energy needs to enter the plane in order to balance the playing field. That was also true in those times. And that is why there was such a strong component of feminine teaching and women's temples. Now we will say there were men involved with these um, institutes. However, the center of it all was the feminine power. And as we mentioned, you see it as sexual energy. However, it is the same 
energy is the actual vital force that runs through you. It is one pathway to tap into it and to learn to work with it. Mm. Are there existing Isis temples or teachings today? Yes, there are. So again, it, it has different elements. So one element we will mention that in Egypt, in your uh, days, so not ancient Egypt, but in your timeline in Egypt today, there is a reawakening of the teachings of Isis. And there are groups of locals that go to Isis temple to connect with her essence and continue that teaching. So that is one way. Another way, which is not separate, but it's right next to it, is through channeling. And we will say that this pathway of the divine feminine is coming through many. They do not all verbal channel. They're not all aware of exact, the exact pathway they are connecting to. They know it is a part of their spiritual evolution. However, it is very present as the actual awakening of the feminine, as we mentioned before, is a very personal process that happens within each person. So in that way, you could say that there is an awakening of the ISIS teachings within each individual to some degree, and then varying degrees and varying levels of awareness based on the situation. So in this example, verbal channeling, it can be very specific as the essence of Isis can directly verbally communicate with you. So your human brain can say, oh, this is Isis. This is her teaching. However, this is just putting a narrow label on it. We hope you understand. I understand. Is there anything I can do myself? Uh, it feels like to me a reawakening of a life, this experience, this Isis temple. Is there anything I can do to stimulate that, to reawaken any of that information or lessons, or maybe more importantly, way of being? We are scanning your energy to give an answer that can be specific to you, but also that can be applied to others. And we will say that a part of the secret, the magic, is learning to activate all three centers. So what you would call the Kundalini, the heart, and you can call it consciousness. It, the names do not matter. But tapping into all three of these centers and activating all three and stepping into your uh, force as a creator from there is a very important key. So the human. Uh, the woman sexuality energy that you're talking about is of the lower chakra, not the seven chakras that you're talking about, the three centers that we're mentioning. So the lower center is the one of that sexual vital energy. It is one of three. So it is significant. However, it must, the full picture must be discovered in order to step into your true creator. Mm -hmm. And when you were uh, touching your body parts, just because not all of you is on screen, you were, were you touching the dantian uh, as the exactly. first? Exactly. Okay. The lower abdomen, that's your center of creation, of creativity and femininity. And then you have the heart, which is the heart center. And that is your true gateway. There is a reason it is in the center. And of course, you have the upper that some people relate to the pineal gland, some people relate to the third eye, some people relate to the crown chakra. As we said, it barely matters. <laughs> there are other ways to interpret it, including energy coming in from the back of the head right here or from the top. The idea that there is another center, it is of your head, of your mind, it is of spiritual awareness and consciousness. So when all these 
three centers that we mentioned, the lower abdomen, the heart, and the mind are all awakened and are all operating together as this well-lubricated machine, then you can truly step into your inner creator and be very efficient in creating, in manifesting, even more so. And you are all doing it to different extent and we will say that your heart my dear is so open in the past two to three years you have gone through so much to open and clear those pathways that now those feminine energies can rise but also be integrated with the heart and find a deeper more meaningful and more powerful point of creation. Mm, I'll have some of that, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the acknowledgement. Yes, quite a few years and a lot of choosing to really be on board with whatever it takes to clear the decks. Mm -hmm. Hathor, I wanna thank you so much for being with us today on Dare to Dream. And at your own convenience, you know, I bless you. I hope to meet with you again. And um, please bring Yafi back to us. We will see you again quite soon. And mm. with our love and our gratitude, we will now return your Yafi back. Excellent. And so I just want to let folks know as she comes back to give her some space that Dr. Yair will be speaking at the Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles coming up. That's February 9th through the 12th. It is held at the LAX Hilton Hotel. I don't know what the numbers are this year. I believe in the past 15,000 people from around the world have walked through those doors. It's an enormous venue. And you can see the level of conversation that is possible. Um, how are you feeling, Yafi? Great. Not grounded, but great. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. That was really beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, she has such, I know I say she and they say they, but the energy feels so feminine to me, so refined in its mm -hmm. femininity that it's hard for me sometimes not to say she when I talk about her, Hathor. Yeah. What, what are you going to be talking about at Conscious Life Expo this year? Yes, yeah, so I am going to be talking about channeling the divine feminine. So I am going to be introducing Hathor and some of the main messages she has come through with. I am going to offer some field tuning and light language to the audience, which we didn't really get into too much today, but you know, <laughs> there's only so much we can say in one hour. So that's going to be a part of it. And I'm going to channel Hathor and also allow others the opportunity to interact and ask questions. I think it's different when you actually interact with the guides and not just sit back, but actually, again, interact, ask questions, hear them, feel the energy. It's different and it's powerful. So I love giving the people, the opportunity to people to actually interact themselves. So that's going to happen as well. What exactly is field toning? So that's a Hathor thing. <laughs> So from my personal experience, Isis um, is more involved with light language and mm -hmm. also um, healing work that is related to the light language. And Hathor, when she makes sounds, um, she calls it field tuning. And it's different sounds uh, that she makes that interact with our energy fields. And what it does, it increases our fields, overlap it, so we're all overlapping. And we're starting to resonate in the same way. We're starting almost like to ride the same wave. And the way to explain it, I don't know if you've ever seen the experiment with the metronomes. It's really cool. There are dozens of metronomes on a table and they're going in different times. And after a minute or whatever, they all start they synchronizing wow. and they start ticking at the same time. And it's not mm -hmm. supposed to happen because the mm -hmm. metronome is supposed to keep the same time and not change. Yet all these metronomes are changing to um, be in coherence with each other. So that's what the field tuning does. It vibrates our field 
to expand it. So we overlap and we start vibrating in coherence. So then the channeling session becomes more powerful because people are in this field and they can feel it and the guides can feel it. It just amplifies everything. So oh that's what field tuning. That's beautiful. And uh, I'll tell folks, there will be a link in the show notes so you can access your tickets to LA Conscious Life Expo to see Dr. Yafi Yair speak, channel, field tone, light language. It sounds like it's going to be an amazing session. I can't I'm wait so for it. <clears throat> and that's Saturday. And then mm -hmm. on Sunday, I'm leading a past life regression experience. So that will be people's opportunity to experience it themselves. What does it feel like to go under hypnosis, to remember other lives, other existences? Beautiful. Well, I will see you there for sure. Yay. I Wonderful. never miss it. And I recommend anybody, if you haven't gone, forget about the how, forget about the why. If you're feeling it in your belly as we speak, if you're feeling it watching Dr. Yair, like, I would really love to see this woman and experiences. Just come, just join us. I have found that every time I leap over all the other questions that take place here, I have the most extraordinary experience. It was always the exact right thing to do on my journey. So Yafi, Dr. Yair, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Ooh, future dreams and goals. Okay, open contact. I want fairies flying everywhere, ETs coming and going. We're all leave it, leaving and living in peace and harmony, loving each other, cooperating, creating magic together. Is that too much to ask for? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think it's exactly why we are here right now doing the work that we're doing. I'm on board. That's a great dream. <laughs> So here's your amazing book, Conversations with the Earth, and um, the back of your book, and here's her beautiful picture. Um, so people can go to yafi, Y-A-F-I, channeling.com, any other place where they can find you? Let's see, Yafi, you can find me on YouTube. It's my full name, Yafi Yair, Y-A-F-I. Y-A-I-R, it's an Israeli name. <laughs> so Yafi Yair on YouTube, Yafi Channeling is my website. You can also find me on Facebook, Dr. Yafi Yair. That's uh, pretty much it. And of course, come see me at Conscious Life Expo, all of us. See all of us at Conscious Life Expo. And Yafi uh, in Hebrew means beauty or beautiful, yes? That's right. And Yair is from the root of the word light. So your ear means will light. Boy, did you get a great name for you. I know, <laughs> but <laughs> if only people knew. <laughs> Powerful, love it so much. Thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for all you be and do. Really appreciate you. Thank you. I end today's show with this quote. The universe is saying, allow me to flow through you unrestricted and you will see the greatest magic you've ever seen. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, and please leave a comment, like. I read all of them, and I appreciate you guys so much. Next week on the show, I'm going to be interviewing Neil Donald Walsh. You might know him as the author of The Conversations with God books, and he's got a brand new book coming out that we will be talking about. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream, and remember what Yafi and Hathor happened to say. It really is about the rise of the divine feminine, male, female, or anything in between. Just remember, receive, step into your potency creatively, and your love 